going live now. Okay, so good afternoon everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. So you're welcome to the Eustachy 0 to 1 class event. So breaking into tech, that is the right way. So um, we have with us already the speakers. So we have, and I'm Ibrahim Mudathir, I'm the business manager for Eustachy. So we'll be starting the program now, but before we do that, so I would like to let us understand some of the engagements of the program. So we have our speakers here and we have the audiences listening in from the YouTube live stream. So as we move on with the program, as the different speakers make their presentation on their topic, so you are, please advise any question you have, you should actually paste them in the comment section and they will be answered. So you should make sure that you already have your answers typed in the comment section before the speaker finishes his topic so it is essential so that by the time it is the section for asking them um, questions we'll just take your questions and then answer them so without further ado then i would like um, mr wasiu sanusi to start with his own presentation okay to start with his own presentation which is analyzing the data science career path so please, if you can start, sir. Oh, I can share my screen now, right? Yes, you can share your screen now. Oh, So while um, Mr. Wasi Sanusi is presenting, so we can have our videos turned off. And so when the next speaker is going to speak, you would switch on your video for introduction and we can move. So you can start, sir. Yes, you are.
I don't, I don't think it's a problem from your side. Let me check okay, that, please. Okay. Yes, I can. So I think you can you can give it a trial now. Okay. So you want me to start all, all over again? Yeah, you can start from the beginning of the slide. Uh, so, uh, sorry to the audience. So I've, I've just, I've just been informed that, uh, that we couldn't, uh, that, uh, you couldn't hear me on the, on YouTube. So what I, so what I said with is that I give a, a brief introduction of myself. So I said, uh, uh, my career, my career background is actually electrical engineering. So I did a BSc electrical engineering, MSc electrical engineering. However, during my master's program, so I came to realize that the future, you know, of the world is all about, you know, about IT, about, you know, about computer, right? Like data science, software engineering, right? So I see that, okay, the future is actually IT. And because of my background, right? So I realized that uh, for me, you know, coming from engineering background, so the best way for me to actually progress in the IT field will be data science. And that's how I, I actually started in my in, in the second year of my master's program. So, so the reason why I give this short background is that if uh, uh, somebody like somebody like myself I can achieve this similar objective, right? Even though I didn't read computer science in the university, right? Then any other person can you know achieve the same objective. So that's why I just gave that uh, quick uh, introduction. So then for today's discussion, so I said I have three you know three uh, bullet points. So the first one is that, okay, we said we want to become an expert data scientist, right? So how do we achieve this objective? So for my own, for my discussion today, I'm going to focus on online courses. So I want to, I want to guide us on how we can become an expert data scientist using online courses. So these online courses can be free or paid, right? So, uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is what the way I'm looking at it, right? So I'm not going to recommend the univers university, right? And, and, and also because we're already on Ustaki platform, right? We know Ustaki has a lot of courses, right? And now we can achieve all these uh, objectives. So the second thing is that I'm going to define data science and I'm, I'm, and I'm going to use uh, Wikipedia for this. And, uh, and for this third point, I'm going to run us through on how we can move from a zero data, uh, data scientist to an expert uh, data scientist, like from zero to, to an hero data scientist. So this I already mentioned, right? That uh, uh, for today's discussions is going to be around uh, online resources and uh, and uh, and why are we doing this why why are we having this discussion why are we talking about this so so the reason we are talking about this is that for you to be an effective data scientist right you have even if we go for you know university degree or something in data science right you need to stay up to date you have to follow you know trend right you have to know what's going on around you so you cannot become a data scientist or, or, a, or a software engineer in an in isolation it's not possible. So it means you have to, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to do self study. This is the, this is the most effective way. In fact, most of the uh, top data scientists they use self study materials to become an expert. Just similar to me. So I use, you know, a, a combination of free online resources and paid courses. So that's why this is the best way. And even when you start uh, practicing as a data scientist or even as a, or as a software engineer, you you will be on Google every time, right? You have to use a lot of resources. So that's why. We have to be conversant with, you know, using online resources to, you know, to equip ourselves, you know, to stay abreast of the technology, the state of art algorithms, and, you know, and the, the recent resources, the recent tools, you know, in, the, in the, this uh, data science uh, uh, world. Then the second point, so what, uh, what is data, data science? So uh, from Wikipedia, data science is defined as an interdisciplinary field that extracts insight from data by using algorithms and tools. So you can imagine data science, data science as a blend of mathematics, 
statistics and computer science. So basically, you know, if you look at Venn diagram, right? If you draw a Venn diagram, so at the intersect of data science, mathematics, so at, sorry, at the intersect of mathematics, statistics, and uh, computer science, you are going to find data science. So what this imply is that for you to be an effective data scientist, you have to have at least a bit of mathematics, a bit of statistics, and computer science, right? And uh, and furthermore, right, data science can be applied into several area. You know, you have application in 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 in, in, in healthcare. You know, in uh, in in uh, you know e-commerce, in energy. You know, in uh, in uh, uh, in so many fields, right? If you look, for example, if you look at Google, right? If you search for an item on Google, right? How do you get what you ask, uh, search for, right? Here you also you are using power of machine learning, power of AI, power of data science, right? You have some algorithm. That are you know doing all the search for you, right? So this is one one area of application. For example, if you look if you look at Google Mail, Gmail, for example, right? You see that some email as classified as a spam email, right? So how do you achieve this? There's an algorithm that's actually actually doing the classification for you in the in the in the background, you know, behind the scene, right? So so you have the, so you, everywhere, for example, right? If you go to Google today and you search for maybe the flight ticket, automatically maybe in, in your if you go to Facebook. In your next uh, Facebook uh, login, you'll see that Facebook will start advertising uh, uh, airline to you. So what do you think is happening? Here also you are seeing power of machine learning, power of AI, power, power of data science. Because, you know, all your cookies, all your interaction with the internet, right, is being logged, you know, it's being logged in the cookies. And this information are being used by different machine learning algorithms, right, to make recommendation to you, you know, to make recommendation to you. So... So this just to give you, you know, few area of the application of data science. Then the next thing is, what are the steps? How do you move from level zero to an expert data science, right? So the first thing is that as to become, you know, to be to to start as a data scientist, you need an environment. You need a development environment, right? And that's why I put everything in pillar points. You can see the first thing is that to become an effective data scientist, you have to write code. And you see, I put I I put something in in bullet there, that. Don't trust data scientists who do not who do not know coding. So most people they get this wrong. Most people they want to start, start with data science, but they are terrible with coding, right? In fact, for most courses they would recommend that you should have been doing programming. You know, you should have been into coding for at least a year or two before you even think about data science. So you have to be very strong in uh, in in, uh, in programming. At least you should be okay in, up, up to intermediate level. You know, you have to understand your data structure, your algorithm. You know, you have to develop your, your problem solving, right? You have to solve problem on different platforms. You know, you have Akarang, you know, yeah, uh, you have a lit code, you know, you have interview, interview bit. You know, you have to sharpen your problem solving skills. This is very, very key. You have to understand your data structure very, very well. Because all these things, you will need them in, in, data, in, in, in data science. They are very, very key. So it means for you to be successful as a, as a data scientist, you have to sharpen your programming skill. So, and what are the most used programming language? You have the R and Python, right? So uh these are the, the basic right and, and for me for somebody like me you know i'm a big fan of, of python although when i when i started when i started my career right as, as a data scientist i learned everything also i learned python i learned uh, r, uh, r so i was using r studio you know i was i started with everything but later on because of my first job and this is what's going to happen to most people right when i got my first job so my company were more into python they were using python for some people it's going to be r so that's why when you are starting up, you have to you have to be open minded, right? So you have to know that this the basic programming language that you use as a data scientist is R and Python, right? So and these two uh, these two uh, language they are they are not much, uh, mutually ex exclusive. So so R is most suitable for uh, statistics, statistical analysis, right? But again, the same thing also you can do in Python, just that R is most is more suitable. Python is more appropriate for machine learning, right? Again, also in R, right? You can also do machine learning, right? So Again, it depend, depending on the company you'll be joining, depending you know, on, on where you find yourself, you, 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 you'll be working with either R or Python, at least, you know, as a data, data scientist. And, and for you to do this development, we have what we call ID, you know, interactive uh, development, uh, development environment. So for the R is R Studio. For Python is PySham, Feature Studio, you know, and, uh, you know, Spider and Jupyter. For me, I use Python, so I'm, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of PySham. I also use Visual Studio. In my current job, I use Visual Studio. In my current job, I was using Python. And also, I use J Jupyter Notebook a lot. Because Jupyter Notebook is not really an ID, but it allows you to, to be able to share your code, to be able to document your code, right? So I also use Jupyter Notebook a lot. Then the next thing is that, as a data scientist, 
for 80 percent of your time for 80 percent of your time you are going to be you know cleaning data manipulating data right and that's why your programming skill has to be very very good very very strong so because you have to do a lot of you know play with different type of data structure so and that's why uh data, data manipulation manipulation is very very important and in python we use uh, pandas for this so and pandas is actually python for data analysis so for you to be able to do the wrangling data wrangling in, in in python you have to be very very good at uh, at pandas right and in r they use a uh, dpl uh, dpl uh, dplr as i mentioned i am more of a python guy and if you are de dealing with big data right you know then you can start, start talking about you know if you want to optimize uh, python right the pandas you can use dask or data table in, uh, in r then on top of this also you know most company they have their data in in uh, in uh, you know in an sql database like postgre like mysql right so for you to be able to do this also you have to be very good also in writing queries in the sql uh, query and this also actually you cannot you can write all this query you know through python also so this is power of python also right so basically you'll be writing uh you connect to your database through python and you can be querying from python so that's why i like python you can do virtually anything from python you just have to know how to connect for example so you have uh, no sql databases like mongodb you know, using PyMongo, I can also connect from Python. So I'll be inside Python and I'll be connecting to, you know, PostgreSQL and I'll be running PostgreSQL, you know, queries, you know, statements, right? So so basically with these three, you know, with SQL, you knowing how to write SQL queries with Pandas in Python or with R, then you, you are good to go. You can get started with, your, you know, your data science career. The next thing is that you have to have an overview of machine learning algorithms. There are so many machine learning algorithms. So we have, of course, supervised learning algorithms. When you say supervised learning algorithm, what this, mean, what this um, means is that you have your data right and you also have a label for example you have you can for, 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 for example right it's like you are saying you have you have a set of animals right so you are going to label each, each, each and every animal say saying for example this is a dog and you can have different dog you know in, in, in different color different posture you know different you know different different ways so basically in supervised learning we are talking about having you know the the label for our, our data set and this can be classification like what i just mentioned is classification you can also have regression for example you might want to predict the price of houses in in, 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 in an environment or maybe in a country or, or, or maybe in a region, right? So basically, you're going to have houses, different kind of houses, right? Different attributes of houses. For example, I can say, okay, I have, I have uh, houses, and these houses, I will describe them by the number of room in the house, you know, the number of room, number of, uh, you know, number of, number of uh, room, the amenities, maybe whether they have internet or they don't have internet, whether they are, whether they are, whether they are two-story building, maybe they are one, one BHK, whether they are, you know, studio, you know, I have this, 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 this different attributes. And on top of this, I'm going to have a target, which is going to be the price of the, you know, of the, the apartment. And using machine learning algorithm, which is regression, I can be able to predict what's going to be uh, the price of, of, a, on, of an unowned house that I might, I might encounter in the future. So this is supervised learning algorithm. So we also have unsupervised learning algorithm. So you have the clustering. For example, right, if you... Uh, uh, for example, so what, uh, when, when do you use clustering algorithm? So let's say you have data set without target. You don't know the tar target, right? You want to, you, but you, you don't have any idea. So let's say you have the consumers, consumer behavior, right? You have, uh, you have, uh, you have uh, a data, a, a set of data with consu different consumers, right? But you don't have any target. You have, for example, I'll give a very good example. So let's say uh, you have a data that has different, uh, different age grade. You have, for example, zero to five years. Uh, or let's say you have uh, the, the uh, 0 to 12 years, you have 12 to maybe 18, 18 and above, right? But you don't understand how they are, your, their purchasing behavior, right? You are, you are, let's say you are selling an item, right? But you don't know how these people, they respond to your item, right? So using clustering algorithm, you can be able to cluster based on different age, grade, you know, age groups and see, and see you know, how, how they interact with your, your, your commodity. So, so in this case, you don't have any label. What you have is that you have data set that you want to cross out to different group, you know, based on different, you know, different ad ad attributes. And that you have in this unsupervised learning is what we call dimensional uh, reduction. Sometimes you have so many attributes, so many of them, right? And, and most of them, they are, they, you know, they are, they are similar. They are correlated, right? So in this case, you want to use something, what, what we call like PCA, principal component analysis, you know, you know, to be able to reduce, you know, this number of uh, features. If, for example, in mathematics, we have what we call, you know, uh, matrices, right? And we have what we call aging value and aging factors. So basically, you know, if you if you look at the aging, aging values of, of your of your of your matrix, right? You see that some values are going to be very very big. Some are going to be very very small. So the big one are the dominating uh, features. So basically, you can reduce a matrix of maybe ten by ten into two by two. 
maybe you just have like two to two dominating features. So this so this is the objective of dimensional reduction uh, that we do in machine learning. Then until this now you have you have learned about different machine learning algorithms, right? At this stage, you have to look at yourself, right? For for example, I'm from engineering background. Somebody might be from mathematics. Somebody might be from you know from art, from uh, uh, from business, right? From computer science. So at this stage, you have to look at your education and see what are the concepts that you are missing. As I mentioned before, right? Because I'm from engineering background, my math at, le at least is very good, right? My statistics is good, but I'm not that good in computer science. So so the first thing is that I started learning, you know, Python, right? I learned Python, I learned R, I learned Java. I started learning. So this is what I started with, right? I started learning so many things. So I know my weakness is computer science. So I started, I started learning about Python. The next thing is that I started solving prob problem on on, on Aka rank. I started solving problem on you know on lead code on uh, on uh, on uh, on uh, interview bridge, right? Just to develop to, to improve my algorithm, to improve my you know my problem solving skills. So I know my weakness at that time is uh, computer science. So I developed it. So for your, for yourself also, you have to look at your weakness and learn about it. Another example is that when I joined my company, right? It's a, it's an energy company. So already because I have electrical engineering background, so it was easy for me. So so because I understand the business, the business need, right? So then the only thing I was just developing was computer science. In the same company, I have another colleague that joined. The guy was a computer science student. But when he joined, he doesn't really know about the business. So he was learning about business. So, so depending on where you find yourself, you have to know the gap in your, in, in your knowledge and you have to fill the gap, basically. You know, you have to learn about the fit. So that is summary of this, uh, of this page. You see, in mathematics, you have to learn about algebra, about numeric analysis, right? In, in computer science, you have to learn about, you know, the time and space complexity, which is algorithm, you know, learn about data structure, about sorting, you know, learn about different machine learning, you know, different computer science concepts, you know, learn about graph. I will tell you, you know, in, in my second job, you know, one of the things until that time I was not I was not paying attention to graph, but then I, I had a serious problem. Then at that time I was only able, able to solve that problem by using graph. You see, so that's why also you have to be open, right? You have to keep learning, and that's why you have to rely on the online, online resources. You have to rely on Google, on Stack Overflow, and you have to keep you know keep learning, you know, upskilling, upskilling. Then after this, right? Now you are filling filling some gaps, right? The next thing is that you, have, you learn about deep learning, right? So generally, people don't understand the difference between different uh, machine learning fields. So you have what we call AI. So you know you have data science, right? You have AI. Yes, I think we have like uh, five minutes more. Seriously? Ah, okay, okay, great, okay, yeah. So AI. Uh, so now you have learned about machine learning, right? Now you have to learn about you know deep learning, right? So deep learning just you know uh, an advanced machine learning. So here we use deep learning more with computer vision, you know, with uh, a, you know, with uh, you know natural language processing. So this is the next thing you learn about this. Then the next thing is that now you are you are good you are, you are good to go. Now when you start doing machine learning, right? Yeah, you're doing a lot of work in the background, right? You have to present your work, right? At this stage, you have to you know start talking about visualization. Now you talk about using different uh, tools in, in Python, for example, you have Matlo Matlo uh, Matplotlib, C bonds, right? Also you have some 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 paid software also to to visualize to, to present your data. So you have what we call Tableau, you have Power BI and all these things. So you have to learn also about uh, visualization. So this is this is very very important because for the top level executive. They will see only your graphs, right? Your visualization. This is how they will, they will, you know, they will track the KPIs. Then you have to, you have to participate in competition also. For data science, you have Kaggle. So on Kaggle, you can comp you can compete, and on Kaggle, when you compete, you can also win money. So this also is also you know is very good. Also, at at some point in your career, you start dealing with big data, big data. So at this stage, Python and Pandas might not be enough. So at this stage, you have to learn about some other tools, right? So you have to learn about you know uh, Kafka, Scala, Spark, and your your 4J. Not so many people will be in this in this in this phase, but you have to be aware of this also, right? That at some time pandas Python will not be enough. You have to upgrade to you know you know you know map reduce you know to Kafka to Spark, Scala and, and these uh, you know big data uh, tools. And that's why as, as as data scientists you have to be flexible. You have to be open to you know upskilling. Then also now most companies they are running you know in the cloud, right? You have the AWS, you have the, the Google you know uh, uh, GCP Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft in Azure. You know there are so many guys, right? So also you have to learn about the all this, about this technology. All these things also they are going to improve your employability, you know, your chance, right? Because most things you have to, you have to deploy the, your your application in the cloud. Then the next thing is that you have to actually get a job. You have to get a job either through internship or you get a paid job. But most of the time you can start with internship. For myself also, I did a free like I did like one month internship, and when they saw my potential, eventually after my so I did uh, one month internship at, at, at the end of my first year, right? And when the company saw my potential. After I finish my master's, they actually give me a job. So this is another way you can, you know, kickstart your career. And uh, uh, and after this, you have to specialize. So I've, till now, I was talking about, you know, generally data scientists. At this stage, you have to specialize. 
So you have people that do that are into natural lang language processing, right? Like your Google search is more of natural language processing. You have your CV specialist, the computer vision specialist. Now we are talking about driverless car, right? In driverless car, computer the, the car is able to see by itself, right? So this is computer vision. So you can specialize in this. You can be a BI expert. You can be a data visualizer expert. You can be a time series forecasting, you know, expert. So as you say, you have to specialize. So depending on the company that you are joining, you need to specialize and also and, and dig more in some area of uh, data science. And also you have to, you know, you know, as a you have to you have to be flexible as I mentioned, right? You have to learn about different tools, right? So to be able to do different stuff. So you have to read papers. You have to read papers. You have to join, you know, join different groups, you know, join local community. And this way you can be able to, you know, you know, you know, stay abreast of technology and you know uh, and upskill yourself. Yeah. I think my time is up. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation, sir. Yeah, so I don't know if I have uh, some questions. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I think when we started the event, so I mentioned that the way the question is going to go is that you ask the question while the presentation is going on. But I think there was an audio issue at, at that time, so maybe people did not hear us then. So what uh, we'll do now okay. is that um, we would have to move on to the next um, speaker. But when once it's done, once the next speaker is done, so questions that we have for Mr. Wasil Sanusi will be written already. So if you have any question for him, you can start writing that in the comment section. You can start asking. So also the second speaker, when he starts speaking, when you have any question also along the way, you should make sure you put that in the comment section. So once the software engineering speaker, the speaker that will talk to us about on software engineering, once it's done, so it will answer any question you have, then we can also allow Mr. Sanusi to answer the questions you have for him on his own presentation. So I think that way we'll be able to answer questions well. So now we'll go on to the next speaker. Yeah. So we'll go to the next speaker, and that is, that is Mr. Abdul Fattah Kupola. So he's going to be talking to us about becoming a software developer, coding, and beyond. So he's going to talk about becoming a software developer, coding, and beyond. So he is also a senior software engineering manager at Microsoft. So you can start your presentation now, sir. Thank you. Can you hear me? Let me know when you can hear and see my screen. Can you hear me? Okay, I don't know if uh, can someone just uh, like I'm audible. I can hear you, but I cannot see your. Yes, I we cannot can see your screen. screen clearly, but we can we can hear you. That's about it. That's it. Was says I'm presenting. How about now? Yes, we can. We can hear me and can see. You just need to present now, yes. Okay. okay. As you need to see my screen, you can hear me. We can hear you, but we cannot see your screen. I think it's clear now. Can everybody can everybody see that? He's presenting now. Yeah, I can see a screen. Okay, I can too. Okay, great. So yeah. Hello everyone and uh, yeah, I'll be talking about um, software development beyond coding. And uh yeah, a little about me. My name is um Abita Popola um, is senior software engineering manager at Microsoft and yeah. That's um, my blog, the link, and as well, you, you can choose to follow me on uh, Twitter. I've been writing software for like uh, 
15 years or so now, yeah, been in the um, industry. And the goal of these, uh, talk the audience, I believe, and people here, like uh, aspiring develop developers, folks who are interested in uh, software engineering or like um, junior early in career software engineers, or people who are just um, curious sorry, about them. Uh, we, yeah. can, we can't hear you. Um, I mean, the volume seems to be low. Oh, okay. That's uh, okay. I'll speak up now. How about now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'll speak up uh, a bit. And the audience for this um talk is about uh, like um as in people who are early in career, like junior developers or like um aspiring software engineers who are just who are, who are learning, or people are just um curious about the field and like um what software engineering about. And the goal of this talk is to uh, provide a framework for people to accelerate their careers. I'll be sharing some of the um, mistakes I made during my uh, learning journey, and then also like with the goal of um, establishing the right developer mindset. I believe this space is exciting. Software engineering is a really um, exciting um, career, offers uh, opportunities regardless of where you are in the world. You can be remote, you can compete um, with people uh, globally. And the typical career progression is uh, like a start as a learner or like someone kind of sometimes they call it apprentices or like a journeyman and acquire the skills you go through like on that phase you become a junior software developer then you become a senior it's kind of like a, a progression over time let's start with the learner three things to keep in mind um, it's about um having a learning plan don't just consume content build to and then start on your on your on your brand Talking about a learning plan, it's about uh, like I'm staying focused. I remember when I started on um, learning programming, I think I lost the first two years because I started out with C. I never mastered C, spent like three months or so, switched over to C++. Same thing, never mastered C++ because someone was like, hey, you know, you shouldn't be learning C++, you should switch to Java. And I went through like um, three or four languages in less than a year or so. And I never mastered any one of them. And the goal, the reason why I'm sharing this is about I'm like, you have to be focused. Choose a language. Doesn't matter. Choose a language. It can be Java, JavaScript, uh, C, C, C Sharp. Choose a language, but then like stay focused with it. Stick with it. S master the concepts because once you know that, it's easy to replicate the concepts across. And again, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So there are no shortcuts. There are lots of books that tell you that like master C plus master C Sharp in thirty days. No, those books just um introduce you to the basics. It takes time. It takes time to become an expert. And also, you don't really need a, a C computer science or like a um, C computer engineering background to get started. Now that you've chosen a programming language, maybe JavaScript or something, don't just consume. It's easy to say, I'm going to go through 20 courses, 30 courses, read 100 books. Yes, that's great, but you also have to produce. So it's about um, momentum over perfection, just like you have to do read and then practice. That's how you cement and solidify your like uh, your knowledge. And it will be challenging at, at the start, but that's part of the journey. And finally, I'm um, starting on your brand. You need to work in public. And by working in public, is uh, you need to be known. That's what you're learning. So find support groups. They're like um, developer groups in Nigeria. They're like developer groups all across the world. Find developer groups. Find mentors all across the world. And make sure that like... Um, you're slowly establishing your presence. Now, like, um, say you, you've completed the, the learning phase, you're trying to transition to like a junior developer. One thing is, I'm like, uh, the, the question is, what's your brand? Are you going to be known as a front end developer or as a back end developer? Or are you going into the software reliability engineering phase uh, uh, area? Or like, would you be like a DevOps person? Your brand should be known because that helps you stand out when you start um, like um looking for like a like a job or like uh, trying to like um be a freelancer the other thing to also know is that interviewing is a skill it takes a different skill set to interview like tailoring your resume tailoring your uh your cover letter knowing what opportunities to apply for knowing how to ace the interview and that actually also takes some preparation. And one thing is also, again, like, um, do a lot of interviews. By doing a lot of interviews, you know what to do, what to expect. looking for. 
And with that knowledge, you can also like um, accelerate your learning. And finally, networking. Now that you've actually like um, established based on the learning phase, you've established uh, like a community. You learn in the community. You start to network because by that you build, you get you get to know people know you, and you also know the um, folks to, to reach out to. Great, you've gotten past that stage, and now you're like a junior developer, right? Maybe you've landed an internship, or maybe you've gotten a uh, a job at a company. What are the tips to do? Uh, like um, to accelerate your growth. First is do the work. Work on difficult things. Learn on every project. And it probably will take uh, a year or two to actually have, uh, like that taste of what software development is about. You just have to like uh, put in the hours. You have to do the work. Over that time, you also want to start diversifying. And by diversifying, so for example, you started out as a front-end developer, like, or you just know about um, JavaScript. It might be time to pick up another language, or it might be time to pick up another tool or a framework slowly so that you broaden your experience. And now it's like uh, you're getting more to the field. Or you try something uh, totally different. Say, for example, you've always worked with uh, like uh, object-oriented programming languages. It might be time to dabble into functional programming languages or like trying out things because the more exposed you are to like, different frameworks, tools, better like uh mental models you start um like um uh acquiring because you see different ways of solving the same uh problem then ask others for help uh when i started out earlier i really would hesitate to ask people for help because i felt uh i would look like i didn't know what i was doing which okay find a mentor in your job or in the field or the company you work build a great relationship with them and ask for help otherwise you may spend one week or two weeks trying to solve a problem that's impossible to solve. Another way is also like um, maybe you want to work on something uh, open source software or an open source um, project because that would actually also expose you to like uh, other people who, who are like um, solving related problems in your field. Another one is um, like um, you know that software development is a team spot. Ask, build great relationships with your peers, talk with other programmers work with other programmers it's re um, it's almost impossible for a single person to build a really really large software system some people do it but it's really difficult and then like um you want learning doesn't end one thing that you actually realize over your career is like um, you have to continuously learn so learning about if for example you, you didn't you don't have on um, the computer science background it's time to start learning about hardware operating systems compilers programming language theory databases network networks how networks work algorithms they this actually makes you uh better or like i'm thinking about software development pra practices agile version control or like um compliance from all of these and if you have time to this is something i strongly recommend read the classics by classics i mean like books in computer science or like in software development that are old maybe like a more than 20 years old but are still really fundamental because if a book is lasted is that old and it's still relevant it has a lot of wisdom, and you can actually uh, learn a lot from it. Another thing to keep in mind is that it's just, it's more than code. You start learning about um, testing, how to write high-quality software, documentation, which helps unblock people. So you write a software, but if it's you write code, right? But if it is uh, not documented properly, or like, and nobody knows how to use it, then it's not going to be so useful. Or then you learn about maintenance, bugs and uh, like um, handling user feedback, making tweaks, releases, CI, CD, uh, continuous integration, continuous uh, development, estimation. If you say, for example, I think this project will actually take two weeks and it ends up taking two months, then that's a, an estimation gap. And these are like um, the uh, subtle other like uh, areas of software development. It's just super important and critical. And again, I reemphasize, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's a multi-year journey. So you want to be really, really consistent. Now, all you need to do is um, like, um, go into your job every day, trying to be 1% better than uh, the past day. Every day you're trying to learn something. And this counts. You might, you might take um, two years or three years, but like if you do this and you're learning every single day, you would stand out. And again, <clears throat> it's being consistent. You may be like, I'm so busy, I don't have any time. There, is actually ways to, there, there are actually ways to cover out time. Just analyze your, your time. How much time do you spend on like uh, social media or other things? And if you cut that down, you might actually um, gain, gain some, some time. 
the other thing is about um, continuous improvement. And just as like uh, Mr. Wesu said, you want to continue to stay relevant, right? There are like um, newsletters, blogs, conferences that you can read and follow to be sure that like, uh, you're keeping a tab on trends on, uh, in the industry. Because by that, you get new ideas and you um, factor that into your consistent learning. And that, that way you stay up to date. Another thing to keep in mind is also like um, you want to invest carefully. You can think of careers as like uh, investment portfolios and uh, like um, technologies or frameworks are your investment options. The funds, the money you have is actually your time. So you want to be really careful when you're spending your money, where you're spending your time, what decisions you're making. One thing that happens, for example, in JavaScript or like in the web development uh, industry is uh, like nearly every two or three years, there is a new JavaScript framework. And people keep saying, oh, this is the best, next best thing, next best thing. I would actually recommend, rather than jumping on every new like technology, learn the fundamentals. And learning the fundamentals, it's really easy to actually like um, swap around uh, like um, frameworks. Because you can say, oh, what's uh, like uh, uh, React? React is based on functional reactive programming. Or you say, oh, Angular, Angular, MVC. And now you can actually start seeing patterns. The more things change, the more they remain the same. And that way, like, um, you, you have to be really careful about what you're investing, your timing. Another thing is um, you never want to make the same mistakes, the same mistake twice. There would be mistakes. No human is infallible. What matters, what you should, what should worry you more is, am I making the same mistake twice? Everybody makes mistakes. I make mistakes. I've shipped a lot of bugs to production. It's just like normal in the field. However, you don't want to make the same mistake twice. So when that mistake happens, you spend a lot of time making sure you assimilate the learnings and you make sure that, like uh, there are things you're going to do to uh, make sure it never happens. You know what they say, like um, experienced software engineers or experienced people don't make a lot of mistakes. And the reason why they don't make a lot of mistakes is because they made those mistakes in the past. And then like uh, the, the last part of it is around uh, choosing your destination. At the junior level, you really want to start thinking, yes, you're getting closer to becoming a senior developer. And when you become a senior developer, what would you do? Are you looking to become uh, like uh, a manager after that? Or are you planning to become like an architect after that? Because again, like um, that's at this stage, you can start um, tailoring your like um, pathway towards that. And then senior and beyond. When you become a senior, almost a given that you have on the technical capabilities. And yeah, you should still continue to learn technical like um, concepts. However, it's becoming much more important to have influence and relationships. Because at the, at the senior layer and above, it's not just what you know. It's also who knows that you know. And you have to be able to like um, influence an entire organization. You like um, you come up with an idea and you have to go pitch it up to like um, the CEO or the C-level executives and say, this is what I think the team should do. This is what I think the organization should do. And at that stage, you need to be able to like um, lay out a well-crafted out plan and you should be able to and uh, like um, influence the entire organization to accept it. And then you also have to have great relationships because if you don't have a great relationship with people, like um, your peers, your manager, your people all around you, no one would want to work with you. No matter how brilliant you are, if you're like uh, nasty to work with, few people would tolerate you and that would actually limit your growth. And that brings us to the end of um, these uh, like uh, talk. It's again, talked about um, like um, tips to accelerate your career, share some of the um, like uh, mistakes I made during my uh, learning journey. And uh, yeah, I hope you have um, the uh, right um, uh, like developer mindset around um, approaching like the career. A career is uh, a long journey, it's like um, 40 years or more. And uh, I hope this was useful. And that's it. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. So it was a very nice uh, presentation. So from the questions that we have, so someone asked, what should be one's motivation to be a software developer? That's a, a, a good question around um, why should I become a developer? Yes. Uh, it, it varies. For some, they enjoy it. I mean, like I just um, personally enjoy writing code. The joy of uh, like I'm crafting something and um, writing, conjuring something that didn't exist before, right? 
So some people like um, writing code. Some actually um, just, for, for some people, it's just a job. Like literally, it is a job that pays. And that's also like another way. And another one is also like, um, it gives you like a, a platform, a framework for influencing a lot of people. And here is the difference. If I make a physical product, say for example, I make a spoon. That spoon to like, um, getting that spoon out to 1 million people would require like a building a factory, right? Ensuring delivery uh, mechanisms and all of that. If I write a program, all I have to do is um, put it out there. It's really easy for 1 million people or 1 billion people to use that program. So again, like um, different motivations for people. It might be like, I enjoy doing it and it becomes a job. For some people it's like, it's literally a job. And for some people it's like, it gives me a platform to influence a lot of people. I hope that um, answered the question. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you so much. So another question is actually, the person is asking, who exactly is a software engineer? Like, because, you know, we have a lot of people saying, okay, I'm a web developer, I'm a mobile lab developer, I'm a disk developer, or I'm a disk engineer. So who exactly is a software engineer? Uh, that's a good question about um, what's, who is actually like a software engineer. I believe um, like um, there are multiple fields, uh, multiple career path on, paths under the like um, software engineering profession. So uh, maybe for example, a simulated would be like, um, who is a doctor, right? Is it like uh, the kidney specialist or is it the like a uh, neurologist or is it like um, the, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, the primary care physician? Again, just as um, like we all call of those, right? We call all of them uh, doctors, right? But they have different specializations. The same thing for software engineers. You can be a software engineer and just be like a front-end expert, like a front-end front -end developer. Or you can be a software engineer. You can also be a back-end developer and you're still a software engineer. Some are database um, experts. And again, it's like software engineering is kind of like um, an umbrella term. And in under it, there are multiple like, career paths, like um, career tracks. Okay. So thank you very much. So with that, so we we'll come to the next question that says, is there, of course, in light of the um, era we are in, so is there a key programming language that one needs to learn for a beginner to become a software developer? Like a key programming yeah. language you should start with that is advice. Uh, I don't have um, uh, any major preference. I'll say like uh, it goes back to the focus um, aspect uh, that I was um, talking about and it's you choose a language that has um, traction, like less popular. So don't go choose an esoteric language. Choose a language that a lot of people use. What matters more is um, you stick to it and um, master it. So for example, say JavaScript, everybody knows about JavaScript. If you want to be like, uh, you want to start out, you might go with JavaScript. Stick with JavaScript for a year and really understand it, be able like and be proficient with it. Because once you do that, it's easy to maybe um, uh, what's it called? Um, switch over to Java or C sharp. The challenge that over and over time is um, people start with JavaScript. Then three months later, they've not mastered JavaScript. They hop on the next big thing. Not the next big thing, the next shiny thing, actually. And like, oh, I'll switch to Java. And then like three months later, they're like, yeah, I'm going to C sharp or I'm going back to JavaScript. And now it's like um, lots of motion, but uh, like um, no movement. There's a lot of energy spent, but the you're actually not progressing. And I hope that kind of um, answers the question. But yeah, like JavaScript or Java or C Sharp, I think those are like um, all good languages to start with. That's Even Python. Too. Yes. OK, that's a very nice um, response. Thank you very much. So this is going to be the last question. So and the person is asking, in making a career transition into software development, so outside the um, courses that you could take. So the person's asking, are there recommended degrees at master's level that can be pursued? Okay, so like, uh, to, let me see if I understand the question is around uh, like, uh, can I go get a master's in some field exactly. to be? Exactly. Doing, uh, yeah. uh, my, uh, just to like a uh, retreat, uh, like uh, what Mr. Wasi said, it's possible to be self-taught and think, um, for example, 
you can follow like on platforms like um Ustaki or like on the other platforms online to like acquire software development skills. Going for a master's and all of that, yes, or like a, a background in computer science, it really helps. However, like um, what happens in most times there too is like um, you learn more about um, theoretical computer science and things like that, which has a, which actually um, good fundamental knowledge. And by learning about that in school, you get to do some practice too. If you want to go like um, learn, uh, like I'll say like, if someone is actually like looking at that, you might want to do uh, like a master's in maybe computer science or information uh, technology or something related to, to that, even um, artificial intelligence. However, again, like uh, it boils back, it boils back down to the um, same fundamentals. You have to learn something about um, coding, and you have to do a lot of it. Uh, I don't know if that um, answers. Okay. It, uh, yes, that's a very good response. So thank you very much for the presentation, and thank you so much for the insightful replies to the questions. Also, so. Oh, before we move on, so I think um, we would like Mr. Wasiu Sanusi, if he's around, so he should um, help answer some of the questions that have been raised. Hello, Mr. Wasiu. Hello, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You mean the uh, the the questions the questions answered by uh, Mr. Popola, or we have a new set of questions? No, 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 no. I meant questions that are directed towards you. Ah, where are the questions? I, well, I would ask, can you read them? I would ask you, yes, I'll read them to you. And ah, you. okay, okay, good. Okay, you can go ahead. Yes, so, so somebody is asking that on a scale of one to three, that is in Which highest is? earning, what are okay. the fields of data science one can focus on? So this person is actually concerned about the most lucrative of the specializations in, uh, in data science. Uh, I mean, we have to be sure, right? So you, you can see in my specialization, I mentioned some sp very specific, uh, very specific uh, special uh, specialization areas, right? Like uh, you can be uh, a CV expert, like CV is a computer, uh, computer vi uh, vision. So computer vision is using like Java, Java You could be a BI expert, right? You could be uh, a time series forecaster, right? So, but this this type of specialization, most of the time, you don't really have control over it, because when 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 companies advertise job positions, right, they just put all the requirements. Data science is that's the one problem with data science, and it's a, it's a general problem. If they, if they are posting position for data scientist, data engineer, uh, BI uh, BI engineer, time series forecaster, a quanta, they put exactly the same requirement. They just post everything. And, and, and for me, it, it is understandable, right? Because most companies, they are confused. They are confused. They don't know what they want. So they want somebody that can do everything. I will give an example. I've seen a position where they are asking for full stack data, data scientist. Full stack data scientist. It means you have to understand programming, right? You have to understand data science. Also, you have to be able to do full stack. In fact, in my own case, when I joined my company, I, I joined as a data, data scientist, right? But for the first uh, six months, I was actually doing uh, backend, right? I was doing uh, Django with Python and everything because there's no database, there's nothing. So I started from scratch. So this is probably most of the time. So that's why I said your program has to be very, very strong. So then when you get started, right, depending on, the, on your company requirement, then you specialize. But sincerely, you don't really have uh, so much uh, control on the specialization. It depends on the company that you are joining. Maybe later in your career, after you have acquired so many skills, then you can specialize. But at the, at the start, most people start as a generalist data scientist. This is most people. They don't generally specialize that at the beginning. So I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> yes, very, very good response. Thank you very much for that. So another question um, we'd like to look at is, this person is asking, can a data analyst be self-employed? Now, so not um, actually getting maybe a um, job under a particular company. So can data analysts be self-employed? Yeah, you can be you can be a freelancer. You can be a freelancer data scientist, right? Yeah, it's possible. In fact, I will tell you, companies. So the the, the only problem is that. I, so uh, this is what I've seen now over time. Data science is not is a field that uh, you can you cannot really get position as a maybe junior data scientist. 
people would not trust you. But immediately you build your portfolio, right? I have that in my in one of my slides, right? Immediately you build your, your portfolio, they know you uh, with something, right? Then they will start approaching you. As I'm talking to you, I I I consult for a company, I freelance for a company. But they, they were giving me those gigs because already they know I have you know some experience, right? But but if you are starting up as a data scientist, it's difficult to get uh, this kind of uh, you know this kind of uh, freelancing job. So what I see that most people uh, do is uh, uh, does is that they start they start up as an intern. They start up as an intern at least to be some experience. Then after they acquire some experience, then you can be, you can be on your own. But first of all, you have to work with the company. You have to you know at least work on some real life projects, right? You know real life stuff. Then you can now stand, you know, you can now, you know, establish yourself as a, you know, like a freelancer or, you know, a self-employed scientist. Yeah, but if you are starting off, nobody will give you anything. I don't think, I mean, this is my, this is my experience. No, thank you very much. Thank you for the response. So I think this will be the final question. So the question is asking, is there any organized association for data analysts, especially in Nigeria? So the person is referring to in them. Um, Maybe to the likes of when you have NSC, Nigerian Society of Engineers, Corin or whatever. Uh, okay, okay. So is, that, is there any organized association for that? No, 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 no. There's no certified body that is certifying data scientists. As I mentioned again, see, I will tell you one secret. Huh? This data science as a feed, huh? it started booming maybe around 2016. And that's why I like the feed. This is why I like the science feed. Because everybody likes it, huh? especially if you have AI or CV. People, people are just crazy about AI. If you have a website and you just put AI, it will start, it will start ranking high. Right, so so this feed is very very new. I told you myself, I started around this time, and I will tell you there's no much difference. In fact, I know if I started maybe with more established uh, established fields like maybe software engineering or maybe like even my engineering course I have done right, maybe I will still be like uh, a junior guy. But because I started with data science and because maybe my my engineering background right, I think I was able to move very very fast because the science is still very there's still so many things coming up and it's it's fast changing. And you have to, you know, you have to be abreast of technology. You, have, you know, you have to be learning very, very fast. Again, the fundamenta is the same as Mr. Pokora mentioned. First is to master the fundamentals, your programming skills, your algorithm, all these stuff, data structures. Then you can you can learn the math and statistics, right? So, uh, so uh, sorry, uh, <coughs> what was I trying to explain? I forgot. Uh, Sorry, can, can you can you remind me of the question again? I think I. No, sir. You 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 answered you answered um you answered the question. You actually yeah. answered the question already because, so yeah, you answered the question. Yeah. He's asking so, if there's any organized association for data analysis. Yeah, there's no, but 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 there's no like a standard standard body like uh, NSC or this kind of body. Yes. But there are so many groups. As I mentioned in my PowerPoint, right? Yes. There are so many group local groups, right? You can join local groups. I know in Dubai, for example, there's a local group for data scientists uh, where they do like weekly webinar, you know, like, uh, you know, trainees, you know. So you can join this kind of uh, organization, right, to build your networks, you know, to learn about state of art, right? You can follow like uh, Medium on, you know, Medium. Medium is a platform where you they write a lot of articles about uh, data science, right? But like a certifying body, no, I don't know of any. Even in Dubai here yeah, or in Nigeria, I don't know. Except for like uh, societies, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir for the insightful responses also. So um, before we move on to the um, next speaker, who is going to be Mr. Felix Kerere. So he's going to be talking to us, all skills and no pay. So how to land a tech job and actually keep it. So before we move on, we just um, want to, of course, inform the audiences on some things about them. Um, you because from some of the questions also that were received, the people asking what exactly is you stacky and what is the platform about. So we'll just um, allow you to enjoy this video for just a few minutes and no pay. So I'll okay. Okay. Yeah, I think I think we just move to the video is not available now, unfortunately. So I think we just move to um, Mr. Felix Kerry. So he's going to be talking to us on the topic all work, all skills and no pay. So landing a tech job. So if Mr. Felix is ready.
Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, first, yeah, first of all, I want to say, I want to commend uh, Ustaki for this platform and also commend our previous speakers. They've been able to touch on like really important uh, aspect of what I want to talk about. Um, so basically, the topic I'm talking about is all skills and no pay. Um, the summary is just how to get a tech job and not just getting it uh, beyond getting it. You're able to keep it. You're also able to grow uh, on the job. And so I'm going to uh, present my slides now just to give you a little background about me. My name is Felix Kerr. Um, I used to be I was formerly the recruiting manager with Andela. Uh, I recently moved to Abzone um, as a talent acquisition manager. I've always been super passionate about technology and how technology can shape the lives of people. And so more importantly, I'm interested in the people side of the business. And so that, that um, um, basically explains why I'm in the talent acquisition space. All right, so without further ado, I'll we'll just um I just to put up my screen. Sorry, just a moment. Okay. Okay. So why while, while I try to put up my screen, I'll just um keep um I'll just start up and then as soon as my screen comes up we'll continue from there. All right, so basically, I said we're talking about um, how to keep out to land a tech job and also keep it. And so the first thing would be your CV, of course. Um, the CV is always the important part. It's always that part that allows you to uh, basically see a job and get a job. Um, and so it's important for us to talk about your CV. How does your CV look? Um, what What is a CV to you? I know most of us have heard about maybe one one time or the other. You talk, you've heard about oh, um, how to put your CVs together and all of that. Um, but just to touch on it because again, it's very important because that the CV is what gives you the doorway to any interviews. And without interviews, um, possibility of getting a job is is almost zero. Right. So for you to get any job, you're going to get, you have to get your CV. Um, just a moment. I'm not sure what's going on with my laptop. I can't seem to share. Just a minute. So let me, let me just keep talking. Uh, as soon as it comes up, then I'll just continue from there. Um, as you already know, you, you might not know, but then typically it will take like five seconds for any good recruiter to review any CV to know whether it's good so, so, or sorry. um sorry please yeah not to cut you um so that it doesn't disturb your um speech could you maybe try to um look into the um full um the slide sharing issue so that we can see your okay because I think that would really really help that yeah would help uh, I'm not sure why this is. Uh, just a minute, please. Sorry. Is there a way I can send it to you so you can share from your end? Because I, I'm not sure what's going on here. OK. Um, is it is it a PowerPoint or Google slide presentation? It's a Google. It's a PowerPoint. Sorry. OK. OK. Um, you can send it. You can send it. OK. I think there's a way you can send them attachment here. Um, All right. 
But while, while I try to do that, let me just continue. So we just um, don't stay okay. idle. Apologies for that. All right. So I was talking about uh, the CV and I said it takes um, the CV is very important because it's your first impression for uh, to any potential employer. It's basically your, the way you communicate the first communication with them and it could possibly be your last. And so um, the CV is just like a marketing tool for you. So it's very essential that your CV speaks for you. And so talking about CV, what, what should your CV look like? Um, basically, you should have your personal statements. You have your relevant skills. You should have, um, you should have um, your career history, academic qualifications, location, and also, of course, contact details. But again, because of our current situation in the country, it's always advisable uh, that do not have your um, home address. You can just have your email or maybe your phone number because um, if we try to reach you by email, we want to quickly reach you. It would be good to, for us to have your phone number. But email, um, I mean, email and phone number are uh, important, but your home address and any other information is not relevant at this moment. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what you should get on your CV. Um, the other things that you don't need on your CV, as I mentioned, your address, personal information, marital status, uh, outdated funds, um, the reasons why you left your previous company. I know some people put that um, irrelevant experiences. Um, and people also put on professional email addresses, your photograph, salary information, references, except when requested. Um, you don't have to put all of that so that your CV is not looking bogus. Um, let me try again, yeah. This is... Uh... So what I'm seeing here is that it's not giving me the option of sharing my slides. So I really don't know what's going on. But, but you have your, your... You can present your screen to see the slide. Okay. Okay, so let me let me do just that. All right, can we see anything here? No. Yeah, but I can see it. Okay, okay. you can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Awesome. All right. So I was talking about um, the things you don't need in your CV. I just talked about references that are not relevant. What are the basic right steps to writing a great CV? The reason I'm starting from that is because it's important for us to get like the foundation right. If your CV is not right, then the chance of you getting that job and landing that job is almost zero. Please and so we're saying that you should share your screen. You should. Like stop. And I think can you? Yeah, can you share it again? Maybe you should. Well, can I well, share I'm it able, again? I'm, I'm, I'm able to see it. Huh? I'm saying. Yeah, can, like, can you stop sharing now? You can share stop again. And... Okay. Just a moment. All right. Okay. So I'm sharing again now. Is that fine now? Okay. Yes, fine with me. Fine with me. Okay. Okay, okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Awesome. So, um, so I said basic steps to writing a great CV. Um, I had a personal statement. What is that thing that people will see, and then they can always connect with you? Um, know what to include in the skills section. Um, just don't include any relevant uh, skills. It's very important that you're able to highlight your um, work experience from reverse chronological order. What that means is that what are you doing presently? And then you're able to cascade it to what you've done previously. Um, relevant academic qualification. More importantly, you're able to tailor it to the applications. The mistake people make is that they just take like a CV one size fits all uh, method and then they just throw it for application. You need to look at the application and be able to tailor your CV. Again, keep it up to date. Very important. All right, just extra tips in you writing that winning CV. P 
people also when they are applying you're you're saving your cv as cv my cv um it's always important that you're able to put your full name as the title of your cv so as soon as the, um, the recruiter sees it he knows that okay this is for this person so note that you're able to save your cv properly with your name um keywords are very important um and i'm talking generally because certain companies use ats and then because the ATS are able to sieve out um, your CV using certain words, you need to be sure by including those certain words so that the ATS will pick. When I say ATS, I mean applicant tracking um, system or software. So basically the key, the, the, the cheat in that is that not really a cheat, but the idea behind that is that when you look at the job description, be able to see certain words that apply to the role and also see how you can key in those certain words into your CV. And when I say keen, I'm not saying that you should just put them um, just like that, just for the sake of putting. You need to know exactly what you're uh, putting that. Obviously, describe what you've been able to do. Um, it's always better to send your CV in a PDF format because most times when you send a word, it becomes distorted. And then sometimes some ATS don't get to, uh, they're not able to pull the CV out. And so I'm laying all the foundation so that you understand that beyond getting a job, it's very, very important. These are the the layers, the ground layers for you to get right. If you get this right, then your chances of landing that job is is, is high. Um, again, you can download Grammarly to correct any form of grammatical error. So this is the moment of truth. I've talked about the CV. I've laid the foundation. The question you should be asking yourself is, what does your CV actually look like at the moment? All right. So now that your CV, you have an idea of what your CV should look like, you're already thinking, oh, I'm, I'm going to get a, like a winning CV. How do you now prep yourself for the interview? You've sent your CV out and then the technical recruiter will say, oh, I think I like the CV. I like what is inside, the way it is put together. And you are invited for an interview. How do you go about that? So we're talking about interview opportunities, readiness and success. The first question is, why are interviews so critical? right? What was the importance of, of, of going for an interview? Um, first is to understand what an interview is. It's basically a conversation. Although in our climb, some um, organizations have turned interview into something else, like an interrogation, right? But then it's meant to be a conversation between a job applicant and potential employer to assess the, comp the job, uh, the, the applicant's ability to basically carry out the job, uh, to see how suitable this can candidate is. And so interviews, basically connect you to the employers. It connects you as a job seeker to the employer. It also helps employers to uh, be able to gauge the right person and be able to select the right person for, for that job. And more importantly, and this is the aspect that people also um, forget, that you as a job seeker, it gives you an opportunity to look into that company and be able to ask questions, ask all the questions that you can ask. And so you're able to ask, assess a particular company, you're able to gauge that from, is that the company, the kind of company you want to work for? And then you're able to present, uh, and they're able to present their skills so that you are you acquired the desired job as a job seeker. Now let's talk about technical interviews. Of course, there are different type of interviews. There's the screening, there are face-to-face -face interview, there's scenario-based interviews, behavior interviews. But the reason we're talking about technical interviews because basically I'm, I know that the majority of the audience um, are technical guys, like maybe um, aspiring jobs, um, uh, software engineers, basically um, coming upcoming tech guys or even experienced tech guys. And that's why we're, we're going to focus more on technical interview. What is technical interview? Um, forget the word rigorous. So it's just the way of describing it. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's hideous or it's, it's tough. It's just uh, an exercise that involves having a deep dive into your technical expertise. So you're looking at how much do you actually know all of this um, when it comes to your capability? And then we respect, respect Respect to developing an execution executing project, and so it's it's like uh, looking at like your specific skills, how you can use those skills, how you gather those skills, and how you've been able to look at the records and how you've been able to use those skills practically. And so there are different stages in a technical interview. There's an the exploratory call. That's basically the recruiter calling you and saying, hey, how are you? And then asking like basic questions. Um, what's your interest? What are you looking at in terms of um, 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 career progression and all of that? That's that's the first um, that's the first um, stage. Then the next stage is the code challenge. The code challenge is the actual technical 
test. It's just like a test. So people use different um, platform. Uh, you heard um, one of our speaker talk talk about Akarang. Um, Akarang is just is another is just like a, a tool that people use. Mo most organizations use to uh, send out a ch call challenge to people. It's just like your test. So, so the idea is. You're being tested for a specific skills depending on your stack, depending on the programs that you've learned or the languages that you are um, that you have expertise on. So that's code challenge. And then there's the on-site remote technical interview where you have to come, or these days is remote where you sit with the technical leaders, maybe the hiring manager, and then they deep dive into your experience. Most times you need to, to pass the code challenge so you can move into the technical interview. So let's now talk about preparing for technical interviews. How do you prepare for a technical interview? What gives you that, that hedge when you're walking into a technical interview and you know that, hey, there's every chance that I'm going to um, ace this. The first thing is you need to prepare like a 30 seconds to one minute elevator speech because typically almost every time, except for some few interviews, the first question will be tell me about yourself. So the idea behind it is that you are talking about yourself in a way to sell what you've been able to do and the expertise that, you, that, you've been, that you're going to bring on board. And the trick behind this question is you are talking based on the job description. So you're eating the job description. You're looking at the key to preparing for that 30 seconds, one minute elevator, is, elevator speech is that you're looking at the job description and you are now speaking to the job description based on what you've been able to do. And so that's how you sell yourself in one minute. And so you're saying, this is what I've been able to do. This is, and then when you've talked about maybe your technical aspect, the, your technical experience, you're also giving them the tidbits around um, your personality, maybe your core values, or if you're not being serious or you're not too too serious doing coding and all of that, this is what you like to do. And so that's like a, you're just giving it like a one minute um, understanding of who you are. But what is the most important is you're able to sell yourself um, aligned with the JD. Another thing is you need to pick programming language and know it really well. It's it's important that at least you are able to understand the particular programming language because when you ask questions, at least you're able to like come forth with, with good answers. Do regular coding challenge, smart practice, do mock interviews. It's very important because I already mentioned there's no technical interviews that you will not do code challenge. Very likely you will do code challenge. Um, come to the interview with relevant project to talk about. It's very important that you're looking at all the projects that you've done and then you're able to speak to it again it ties into your 30 seconds, one minute elevator speech. Again, you need to be careful not to ramble on it, try and hit the nail on the head. And then that's that's why you need to come prepare with different projects. Because when they ask you a question, you're able to say, oh, I actually did this here. And this is exactly what I did. Other things that you need to know, you need to research on the company you're interviewing. What is the uniqueness about them? If it's possible, research on your interviewer. Um, Another aspect that is subtle is that you're dressing. Of course, these days interviews are remote, but at the same time, that does not give you the levity to just come up anyhow and dress anyhow. You need to dress for the occasion. A simple shirt will do. Not, not necessarily, you don't have to come with a t-shirt or look like you are super relaxed because in the end, it's an interview. When you get into the office environment or the company, uh, depending on how they dress, you can now go ahead and dress. What are the meaningful questions to ask? during interview some people come into interview and they say oh they, have, they say do you have a question and they say oh i don't have it. it's very important that you have a few questions what do you do uh questions like what do you like about working here what are the frameworks tools that the company uses um what 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 are, what do you test how do you test your code what's the most challenging project you've worked on here so you're asking the interviewer the interviewer gets a sense that hey this person is actually um um, knows exact, knows what he or she is trying to get at. And then it allows the interview to also share his or her experiences and you can garner from that. What are the common inter technical interview mistakes to avoid? Um, not preparing enough. That's, that's one in, in mistake you don't want to make. And then also jump into the code without taking a moment to think you through, not like being patient to read the instructions. I've seen many, uh, a software engineer come in and then they are like over pumped and then they just and that ties into the third point being too arrogant and opinionated instead of sitting down and then ensuring that they're able to listen to the instruction and then slowly work their way around the code 
they just like jump into it and and just go go head on not making conversation and chit chat it's important for you to be very calm and then if you have any question ask questions so that you have guidance very important um how do you get the interview opportunity you need to apply for the right role you need to know what you want be specific know your strength um the the previous speaker talked about building your network you need to be able to build your network um you need to have we already talked about your exceptional resume uh, create your brand um via social media social platforms social media linkedin um, medium twitter whichever one works for you research your target uh, companies reach out to hiring managers or recruiter um these days if you see a company that you really like make that effort to reach out to the recruiter via linkedin or via hiring manager just put yourself out because recruiters really rely solely rely they don't solely rely on job board so if you reach out to them they're able to say oh yeah someone reached out to me and then there's a role that comes up they're able to remember you um how do you put yourself in a place where you are employable and then you're job ready um i think my time is up but i'll just take uh, i'll just ask for like two minutes and then i'll wrap up um what what the the common thing is that we always think what do when we look at employers we're thinking oh what do they actually want and we're like ah it's the ability to do the job but it goes beyond that what employers are looking at is your ability to do the job plus extra skills and those soft skills are the way you're able to carry yourself your communication skills the way you're able to do certain things your problem solving skills and i've highlighted a couple of skills that you should be like prepping yourself for if you don't have them try and build them we're talking about self-awareness we're talking about feedback mindset um gone are the days where you have software um, um i mean tech guys that are just like all by themselves they don't talk to anybody the only thing they know is just coding coding they're not friendly that does that will not take you far you need to be able to exhibit leadership if you're thinking of growing far you need to be able to exhibit critical thinking problem solving self-motivation um time management is very important as well you need to have strong work ethics uh emotional intelligence these are the skills that you need to be uh um, basically um um build up as, as a person building a career so let me just quickly talk run through this i know uh, my previous uh speaker had spoken around that so i've just bought a few things uh confucius once said that choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life so people mistake job for a career a job is what you just have the things that you do and then to get income basically a career is the entire sequence of the job that you're able to hold through a lifetime so your career is what you is 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 basically based on what drives you what's the motivation and so that's how you're able to build your career right so um what are these competencies that you need that will propel you in your career as a tech person you again just to buttress the ones that i've mentioned critical thinking teamwork collaboration professional ethics you need to be technological savvy data analytics is very important business partnering mindset service orientation so let's reflect now just to take a reflection all progress takes place outside the comfort zone you need to be able to like move shift your your mindset and then it also say it also basically buttresses the fact that for you to build a strong career you always have to go beyond job and showcase value to the business by being the ultimate business partner so even as a tech person you don't have to like, just stay in one space as the previous um um speaker said you're looking at coming i mean speaking to management bringing ideas and so you're always looking to show values you need to do something you love you need to stay in motion you need to take the risk and also cut down on distraction so i'm leaving you with this action point i need you to go back to your cv or resume you need to see if it's a winning cv you need to make it a winning cv again you need to build your network even as a tech person and your professional brand what do people know you for and then start thinking about the industries and companies you would like to work for and start applying and before you know it you will get that job and you will also keep that job and grow in it thank you for your time thank you very much thank you so much it was an enjoyable session thank you for the um presentation so um, I think we would go on to the questions that the audiences have for you. So, someone is asking here, 
that are there any platform or what are the should I say most efficient platforms to actually get jo um, job openings where you can actually search for job openings whether as a developer most especially junior developer or um, data scientist whether you're looking for internship or you're looking for a job so like are there any reliable platforms you can um, point towards in terms of getting a job right um that's a, that's a good question i i would say I, I would say not because maybe i want to i'm i'm running away from advertising any job platform but the truth is um there are a lot of job boards out there um but i've never been like a champion of job boards as i mentioned in the presentation not recruiters really rely on job boards because what it means is that you have like a deluge of applications that may not even be relevant to what you're doing so to answer the question correctly i talked about networking um the first thing is ask yourself what what are those companies that you want to work with what are those companies that you know that suits what you're looking for in terms of uh, do they offer internship even if they don't offer internship it's for you to push uh, for that, there are, there are companies that never started with the mindset of doing internship, but because a couple of people reached out to them and they felt, oh, let, let's explore this opportunity. So what I would say in summary is that know, list out the companies that you feel that you that you would like to work with. Look out for their representative on LinkedIn or anyhow you might want to get their contacts and then push yourself to them. Like, let them know you. Let, let them see you. And I'm pretty sure that when the opportunity comes up, they would they would reach out to you. That 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 is my own way of explaining that because I would not at the top of my head I can say that they're like super trusted platform that you can always see internship. Of course, you always look around uh, LinkedIn posts, um, social media, and also job boards. But for me, the sh more likely surest way for you to be seen and quickly picked up is doing i mean going through that route that i just mentioned i don't know if i answered the question yes thank you very much so now someone is asking that especially in this in this um age of um let me say people going more to just you know know how to do stuff know how to program or become a software developer without necessarily going to maybe a university so someone is asking that can a secondary school leaver that's only graduated from um secondary school actually get a good job as whether a developer or a data scientist in this tech space? Okay. Uh, that is an interesting question. Okay. Um, is it possible? Yes, depending on the organization. But then we also know that where we are in terms of um, a country and in terms of the requirement that almost all organizations will put out, all organizations will put out is for you to have like a basic like university degree, maybe an OND or HND. And they, they, there's, a spe there's a reason for that. Maybe they feel that when you get to that level, there's a level of thinking. And of course you need to get like a certain level of education um, I'm not sure because I know that when it comes to tech, tech is tech industry is very unique. People just take up um, um, expertise, even like even without going to formal education. But when it comes to like getting like a formal job, because of the how do I put it, the environment that we are as an organization, as organization, almost every organization would expect that you get a certain level of, of education. So maybe freelance job, maybe, um, yeah, a few companies, but mostly if you want to get those like really in code, good job, high paying job, you might have to at least uh, walk your way to an OND or HND. That's, that's just the basic requirement most of the organizations are put up. Okay. Thank you very much for that. So I think that will now come with another question, like a child question to that. That's, so one with, um, let's say, the person that studied a course in university that is not STEM related, that is, it's not sciences, tech, engineering, or mathematics related, does that person have a shot 
at actually getting good jobs. Now the person, okay, is not a secondary school leaver, has gone to university, so is there a shot at getting a good job? You don't have a STEM background. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. By by a shot, I want to believe that you're saying that is the person. Is there a chance that the person can get a tech job? Yes, a good tech. Yes, job. absolutely, absolutely. Um, recruiting these days, we've gone beyond looking at like BSc or or anything. Frankly. Um, any recruiter that is still looking at that, except it's like a specific, I don't know, and that that's company dependent. Like if a company says, oh, we have to get like a computer engineering for whatever reasons, then that, that's another case. But generally, any recruiter that is still looking at BSc for them to um, basically pick up a tech person, like a smart like software engineer, um, maybe the person has not started recruiting because um, the whole idea behind getting a, tech, um, a software engineer or a tech person is you're looking at the person's skills, you're looking at the person's portfolio, you're looking at the person's, um, basically what the person has done in terms of the program language that the person has worked on, the projects that the person has worked on. And if it basically keys into what you're looking for, then that's it. Um, BSD or ND does not come into play here. So yes, absolutely. The person has a shot. Okay, thank you very much. So, another person is asking because um, I think one of those things also that would be very valuable to the audience is to know maybe there are some red flags that maybe when you see in a job description, <clears throat> so in a, in a job description that would actually tell whether the job is not um, a good job or uh, it's maybe there are some things that you can see from maybe a job the um from a job description from an interview process that would maybe point out that, okay, you know what, this particular company or this job is not something I should go for. Are there any anything that one can actually note? Yeah, um, that, that's a great question. Um, so are there some things that you need to look out for, red flags? I know a couple of my colleagues have put, like, um, they put, um, what's the word? materials out just to like let everybody know the, what you should look out for in terms of maybe a job that does not tie into what you're looking for. Um, first off, you're looking at the JD. If you have, if you see, let me just talk about the job and then I'll talk about the organization. If you see a JD that is super crowded and there's no, just like uh, the first speaker talked about when, the, when they say, oh, they're looking for like a, like a superhuman or maybe like a Voltron. I don't know if people are familiar with Voltron. <laughs> like you have different parts, different parts, and then these parts, even nowadays, you have specialized uh, specialists in these different parts, and then you just want to ram, ram it into one space. And then they are looking for like a super experienced person, and then the pay is not even commensurate. That should be a flag. Um, in terms of the company, if you go do your research in the company, the company doesn't have like a like a an updated website that you can easily get information on. That should be a flag. Um, you can also, for what is worth, Nairland finds a way to like pick out this this company. If anybody's not saying anything about the company, or you check Nairland and there are like really crazy reviews about the company, then no. What you can also do is that you can search for people that are already working in the company and in a subtle way, be able to ask questions. Um, typically with JD, you can't tell if this job is, is rubbish, but um, again, when you see it's su super crowded and there is no, there is no, um, how do I put it? There's no alignment. There's sort of disalignment to the job description and you don't have so much clarity then that should be a problem. What I typically would advise anybody when you go through a job description, because a good job description tells you the first, mostly the first three lines, first four lines of the responsibilities are like the core responsibilities of that job. And so for you to know, if you, if you come across any job description and you're not sure, please feel free to reach out to any person that you know that it's in the, HR space or text, I mean, uh, talent acquisition space, for them just to, just to talk to people, just say, hey, 
I saw this job description. What do you think about it? You might just be surprised the person will know someone or some someone will diagnose someone in the organization and be able to give you like premium information around that job. So mostly that's what I would say because with the way the world is going, you can't really tell which job is super cool. I know companies that they don't do a good job in putting like really beautiful, catchy CVs, but they pay well and the companies are really good. So you know is for you to be able to ask that question and then be able to like justify and if you're not if at any point you're not sure and it just comes to you like hey this job description looks somehow and then this company is also looking somehow ask questions and then be sure that whoever it is that's giving you questions and the answers is someone that you can like beat your chest and and you know that you can rely on their information okay thank you very much for that so um on a related um as in relation to that question also so is this a red flag or it's a norm or maybe from maybe varies from company to company where you have um, a recruiting company that organizes several interviews so you have behavioral interview technical interview just a lot of interviews before you get the job so the person is asking does it even make the job worthy like oh does it mean that this job must be really really good or is it a red flag or it's something that is normal Hmm. Um, interesting question. I'm 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 trying to see how how to um, I'm trying to see the best way to answer that question. Is it a red flag? Maybe not. Is it a norm? No, not necessarily. I will answer why it's not a norm because the truth is, and any recruiter will know this. We are in a war for talent, like you can't you can't rest your you can't rest your heart over any talent if you see a good talent you you would do better if you're able to fast track the interview process because the truth is as you're talking to this particular talent and another company is also looking to speak to this talent and if you drag then you will lose in the end and so all proactive um hr or talent acquisition people they're trying to, as much as possible to fast track that interview process to make it like really shorter, but effective. And so that Hello? Hello? Clear, the interview process is like super, they drag. I know companies that drag their interview process uh, for like weeks. And so when it comes to behavioral interviews and all of that, it depends on the company. It, it depends on what the company is looking at um, and they're looking for. Because again, depending on the role that you're applying for, there are some key aspects they need to check for. And it's only those interviews that will bring them out, that will bring them to the fore. So um, is it a red flag? Not necessarily. Um, you would know if it's a red flag, maybe out of if you have maybe done your research on the organization, okay. but if it's what they do, and then you're also able to connect with maybe one or two people that work in the organization and they tell you their experience or you're able to read about their experience, then fine, it's not necessarily a red flag. Is it a norm? Absolutely not, because okay. there are companies that, uh, the idea right now is to move really fast with recruiting and be effective. Okay. Thank you very much. So this would be the final question. So um, someone said, what should a self-taught developer with less than two years experience focus on? So, I mean, that should probably be in terms of um, what the person is going to be presenting to the recruiter. So, in terms of um, getting a chance at the job, so someone with two, less than two years experience, so what should the person try to focus on? If I get your questions right, if I get your question right, you're saying that someone with like um, entry level experience, yes, yes, what should the person highlight so that you can get the job? Yes, right. Um, mostly at, at that stage, um, I know typically, again, the, the norm or where we found ourselves is that people are always asking for experience already when we know that. This is an entry level role. And so I will speak mostly for maybe myself. What what I will typically look out for, um, again, maybe this should be a norm, but then every company has its own uh, peculiar 
um, way of running things. What I will look out for is what you've done previously, um, whether in school or whether outside of school, whether internship or whether volunteering um, opportunity, opportunities that is closely related to what you are applying for. Again, it now boils out, um, it, now bonds, uh, it now basically boils down to how you're able to showcase this in your CV. And that's why I, I spoke about the CV. That CV is the strongest instrument for you to land in that job because it gives you the opportunity to, pre, um, to be picked. And then when you come to the interview, you're able to present whatever it is that in your CV. And so it now shows, it now behoves of any person that is trying to apply in that position to critically look at the job description. People really study job description. You need to look at the job description and say, where have I been able to have these skills? Where have I been able to do it? And then you're thinking beyond, thinking beyond maybe like a formal setting. If you've done it maybe um, during your internship or maybe your final year, maybe some something around that, you're able to critically look at maybe, for example, if the, the JD says, or someone that has maybe like, um, that is able to communicate and all that, or is able to lead, maybe talk, talk leading, leaning to leadership, be able to tailor your CV and bring out those, those, those um, competences and push it to my face as a recruiter. And so I'm seeing the things that I want to see that's related to job description. And when you come for the interview, you're able to speak to the things that are in your CV. And I'm not saying that you should exaggerate or whether lie, and, and so that's the way to go about it. And that's how I say it for entry level roles. You're able to push out the things that you've done relate, in relation to this, whether it's two months experience, one, one, one year experience. Basically, you study the job description and um, align your CV and whatever, however you approach. If you're sending in an email, maybe you're contacting me on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. be able to push that and say, oh, this is what I've been able to do around this. And so any recruiter that sees this will know, okay, this person actually has some form of experience around this particular competencies, and then um, possibly call you for an interview. Okay. So thank you very much. So uh, actually there are some uh, questions that are coming, but I think what we'll do is we'll move on to the um, next topic. So once we are done, so if there is still, um, if there is still time for us to take in those questions who so would ask uh, those questions. So thank you very much for the presentation. It was really, really nice. It was insightful. It was uh, beneficial. So thank you very much, Mr. Felix. Thank you. It was my pleasure. So uh, now to the next topic, which is um, Eustachy Zero to World Class. So, but before then, so like I mentioned, some people were asking what Eustachy does and um, just to get more insight about uh, Eustachy. So we'll just play this video for you so you get an insight. In today's world, you know, in today's world, IT professionals such as software developers Data scientists, UI designers, and many more. I'm not sure anyone can hear In this. Today's world, IT professionals such as software developers, data scientists, UI designers, and many more are one of the most sought after professionals. Therefore, choosing any of the IT career paths is a smart choice. However, as an African, Acquiring the necessary skills to become a seasoned IT professional can be challenging. You have to deal with a lot of poorly made instructional materials, courses that make every concept... Sorry, please, is the audio loud enough? And if you're fortunate to find a really good learning resource, the cost will be okay. far from affordable. This no, is no. why we created not. New Stacky, the first online stock learning institute in Africa. Yeah. 
think this is yeah the audio is good now in today's world it professionals such as software developers data scientists ui designers and many more are one of the most sought after professionals therefore choosing any of the it career paths is a smart choice however as an african acquiring the necessary skills to become a seasoned the audio was okay professional can be challenging you have to deal okay. with a lot of poorly made instructional materials courses that make every concept more complex to understand and if you're fortunate to find a really good learning resource, the cost will be far from affordable. This is why we created Ustaki, the first online stock learning institute in Africa that teaches industry-relevant IT skills at a very affordable price. How are we different? Ustaki takes you from zero to world class in your chosen IT path by offering very affordable micro degree programs with detailed high quality videos, quizzes and assignments. Just to make sure you understand every concept as expected. Our programs contain localized content tailored specifically to Africans. And that's not all. We also offer insightful code review to solutions from assignments. Use Stacky Mentors to guide you along on your learning journey discussion forums where you can meet other students and whether you are at home or on the go on pc or mobile you can always practice what you have learned with our easy to use live code editor upon completion of any ustaki micro degree you get a certificate of completion resume review and an opportunity to start earning either working for you stacky as a code reviewer working on paid gigs or getting a job through the you stacky jobs portal so are you ready to become a world-class it professional and get the opportunity to earn immediately after graduation head on to www.ustacky.com or download the app on google play store you stacky your stack learning companion. Yeah, okay. So basically, that is just an overview of uh, your stack here. So now we'll be going on to the next topic. So, and that is um, zero to world class. So, and that is going to be presented by me, Ibrahim Udathir. So, I hope everybody can see my screen. No, we can't see your screen. Oh, sorry. So can you see my screen now? Yes. OK, good. So um, I'll be presenting the Zero to Work class. My name is Ibrahim Mudathir, and I'm the business manager at uh, Ustaki. So before we go on, I would just uh, like to make a brief, um, say maybe description or info about myself. So like I said, I'm Ibrahim Mudathir. I'm the business manager at uh, Ustaki. I'm also a software developer so and also a ui ux uh developer also so basically that's what i that's what i do so now to the main topic of the um, event which is zero to world class so now we know that experts have already said it it's different experts economists developers even policymakers and different governments, they've said it that 
technology is the future of Africa. Now, and the major reason why this is, is especially also because of the seeming youth population that we have in Africa. So we have very large number of um, youth population and a lot of these people, of course, are going into tech. And also another reason why experts say that for Africa to have a very viable future and also to be able to compete with others on the global scale, then technology is essentially the future for Africa. Because Africa, if you look at it, have missed out on like the previous revolutions, like say industrial revolutions, we've missed out a lot on them. However, we have a chance at competing with other countries in the world today due to um, technology and more specifically um, information technology that has to do with um, you know, computers and all. So, but there is a, pr and also one thing also that brought that to fore, or maybe when people have been doubting it before that, you know, maybe it's not true. Maybe technology is not the future of Africa. One thing that has made it known or that has cemented that particular view today is the fact that COVID-19 came around and we all saw what happened, especially also in countries like the US, UK, and we experienced um, part of it also here in Nigeria, when businesses worldwide, you know, how to make a lot of their business operations digital. For example, this event we are having, we are having a virtual event, mostly due to the fact that there is still restrictions as to gathering and how you can, you know, hold your events. So that's why I see a lot of virtual events coming up. So because of that, business operations have gone more digital. And because of that, there is already a shortage of qualified tech professionals in the world already, like software developers, data scientists. So with the increase or with the advent of COVID-19, it made the need for those tech professionals to be really, really felt. So you see people looking for developers here and there, you know, people that can build platforms or that can make their businesses run virtually and, you know, require um, less physical um, activities. And because of that, we see, you know, a lot of um, a lot of companies maybe laying off their workforces because now they've seen that, okay, using technology, they can now get maybe more than what they have before. In fact, more than what they used to get before in terms of uh, their, in terms of the production. So they get more, 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 more value for that compared to when their business operations were still largely, um, let me say, more physical or having so many humans, yes, in, in, in operation. So because of that, there is an increase for tech professionals. However, sadly, Africans can't feel this position, unfortunately. And why? It is because even with the COVID-19, um, what's it called? Even the COVID-19 studies that have said, okay, there's an increase in number of developers that are needed. So why can Africans or especially Nigerians feel um, this position? Because before COVID-19, statistics already revealed that we are lagging extremely behind when it comes to tech. For example, Advert Business Review in 2019 actually states that uh, Nigeria, which is Africa's largest economy, was the lowest in tech skills when it was ranked amongst 60 countries. And you need to know that part of those countries that led or that came before Nigeria included um, countries like Kenya, Pakistan, North Korea. So our countries actually came ahead before Nigeria in terms of tech skills. So that says a lot about, you know, the Africa's biggest economy coming last as, um, you know, in terms of um, tech skills ranking by Harvard Business Review in 2019. So, which is, of course, that is not that is not good. Why can't Africans fill this position? Number one, poor learning resources. So we have a lot of people that want to become software engineers, they want to become web developers, mobile app developers, they want to become data scientists. You know, they want to build, some people, of course, want to get jobs in these positions. And of course, some people want to, you know, solve problems, solve world problems with this stuff, maybe with AI, with machine learning, computer vision, stuff like that. But there are a lot of the resources that we have online, whether on YouTube, free courses, on some platforms, uh, several platforms. You have very, very poorly made learning resources. And also another thing is that these learning platforms are not even flexible enough. So what do you mean is that you can find some other platforms that will tell you that, you know what, we'll be taking you through some of these um, learning materials or how to become a programmer 
how to become a data scientist, you say, okay, you know what? We can take you through from maybe a webinar like this. So where you have to come in and you know clocking and you must be there. So it is not really flexible enough so that you can take those courses or you can learn those stuff whenever you want to. And also those learning resources or platform are not even relatable to a lot of Africans. So, you know, when somebody is um, teaching you something and is giving you um, examples of, say, for example, you are doing a data science um, project and somebody is telling you, for example, and saying about the U.S. Um, Federal Reserve, is talking to you about um, the U.S. unemployment. So you don't actually relate to those kind of examples or problem, or even it also comes in with uh, the accent. Sometimes we know there are a lot of countries that we have, I mean that you have their developers or tutors online with different accents, different intonations, and you know the way they speak, so that it's even hard for a student sometimes to understand what the instructor is saying. And if you are fortunate enough to find a platform that has a very good learning resource, the learning platform is flexible enough, the resources are relatable to you if they exist, they'll be really, really expensive. And there are a lot of you know platforms like that that to an average Nigerian or to an average African, they can actually afford those platforms. So these are one of the key reasons why we don't see a lot of Nigerians, Africans, in these um, top tech positions, or you don't see them using um, tech to actually build amazing, amazing uh, products. So we should have more than what we have uh, currently. So, of course, what is the solution? So this is what we um, are trying to do at Ustaki, and which we have started already, and this is what we are doing at Ustaki. So the team came together and um, to see, okay, what can we do to solve these problems that um, is being faced? by Nigerians or by Africans all over the world. So what can, what can we do to actually help them solve this particular problem? So this is why Ustaki was actually created to address specifically these problems. And how do we do that? Is that we know that, you know, you can go to health platforms and read texts, read books, but there is something about learning when you have audio and you have the video also. So because some people are very good at, uh, learning visually that is maybe they just learn through maybe um, reading something why some they actually do not they actually don't um they don't learn well by just looking they learn well by listening to what the instructor is saying or listening to a particular person giving them um report on or giving them guidelines on what to do so because of that you start it came up with immersive video content videos that are well explained by seasoned tutors in their field on software development, on data science, and several other um, fields. So they actually, we brought them together to make really, really brilliant quality videos. It's not with the videos that you won't see what is being coded or what is being written. You see them clearly. Also, another thing is quizzes and assignment. Of course, you can't just keep on watching videos and watching videos and not being tested. So because of that, Ustaki has highly engaging quizzes that you do at, you know, several um, several sections along the way in your learning and procedure. As I know, as, um, okay, as maybe some people that already know the platform would already know, so there are quizzes like that. And also there's a community where, we know, like the speakers have mentioned before, in fact, a lot of the speakers mentioned it. I think all the speakers mentioned community network. So it is essential that you have a community of like-minded people that can help you like um it was said this journey is not a journey that you can go alone so you need a community you need the backing of others to help you out when you have problems so this is why the ustaki has um a community trial discussion forum where people can actually ask questions they can talk to each other and um, you know get their problems solved also we have a mentorship program also where our mentors actually answer questions and guide our students on the best way to achieve the problem because we know that it is not just easy maybe just watching videos alone taking quizzes you might be stuck so you might need uh you know some solutions to your problem and also i must say that it is also a good news that for people already on the platform in terms of um ustaki scholarship students which is the scholarship we are running presently now and also um the ustaki um students generally 
It's also good news that because through this mentor mentorship, I also announced that we are having new mentors being added to the platform to also complement the effort of the uh, previous mentors. So that means we are going to be having more mentors to answer your questions on the discussion uh, forum. Another thing also is the fact that, you know, something was mentioned by uh, Mr. Abdul Fattah Kukwala that it is essential that you don't just consume, but you build. But when you're also building, it is good that you build something that is uh, that can challenge you, something that would let you use those skills. For example, you can learn, uh, you know, JavaScript, you've learned maybe the whole of JavaScript. So how do you know that you actually know JavaScript? Like what is said that you don't just consume, you build. So it's by actually building the project. But when you build, build projects, you know, some of those things that um, would also maybe get you that internship, get you that job, is the fact that when the recruiter can see that, oh, you actually did this, amazing, this is nice. This is the kind of person we need. So this is why you start key. When we give projects, we don't just give projects, just, you know, just build projects that are not useful or that are not something that is applicable in the real world. No. So we come up with real world projects. You'll see some of them as I continue with my uh, presentation. And also, another thing that we also thrive on is feedback. Feedback. So we really, really listen to our students and we listen to their um, to whatever they think, okay, it's wrong. Oh, you know what? I don't like this. Oh, can you please help me with this? Can you change this? How do I do this? So we make sure that we are available to um, hear the feedback of our students on how to actually you know better the platform because you stacky as i said was engineer that was created as a result or as a, as an answer to the call of who or what platform can actually solve this problem that is inhibiting africans or nigerians from actually getting these um, world class employment or building world class um, solution also another thing is that when you've done whether you've done your project or you've done an assignment and all, there are code reviewers that would actually review your code. And you must know that these code reviewers also have gone through, you know, orientation. They've gone through several um, orientation on the platform on how to properly review code for students and how to give insightful feedback. So you don't just, you are not alone, like we mentioned, you are not alone. When um, with the Ustacky platform, you get very, very good support in terms of your mentorship when you submit your code for your project for review your code reviewers are actually the ones that will review your code for you and also because we know it is a wide problem in nigeria and africa as a whole which is electricity problem and we know that most times our phone are usually on so because of that we have in-app coding where you can do to a very large extent a lot of examples and exercises that we have on the Ustacky platform, you can run them on your mobile on your mobile um, application on the Ustacky mobile app. So because we have a mobile app also, so you can run a lot of those code on your on your mobile app. Also, if you're even using the um, if you're using a PC, maybe you are um, having problem. You just want to start maybe JavaScript, you're going to start Python, and you're having maybe some issues setting up the development environment. So easily with our coding environment. You can actually start and you know start getting to practice some of those things that you have so that is the essence of having the in-app coding and also the mobile app now one other thing is that we give you career guide and resume review so that is one essential thing you can see from all what the speakers have said one key thing aside learning building and you know owning your skills in whatever field that you've chosen whether software or data science one essential thing is you want to be able to get a job with that and having a good resume having a good cv like mr felix mentioned is very important so which is why our micro degrees because we have collection of courses which are bundled together to um, be called a micro degree so in every micro degree there is a dedicated course for career and um, resume. So it is going to teach you extensively how to write a good or proper CV or resume, everything you need to know about writing a proper resume. And once you take that course, you are also going to be given a project to actually write a proper resume or CV 
and send it over to be reviewed. So your resume or your CV is going to be reviewed and you're going to be given guidance on how to correct it. And not just your resume, for those that are going to be made, whether you're a developer, you're a data scientist, it is important that you have a GitHub uh, repository where you, of course, put your work so I can share with maybe recruiters or other people. So because of that, we don't just do um, a resume review for you. You get your GitHub reviewed and also your LinkedIn profile. Your LinkedIn profile will also be reviewed because it is important. We know today that LinkedIn is a very, very good social networking platform for, you know, um, employ employees and employers, you know, to get the network like was mentioned before. So because of that, we review your, review your resume, your LinkedIn profile and your GitHub. So it's essential. We have a dedicated course for that in every of our micro degree. And once you are done, okay, so what is the next thing? Of course, you want to probably get a job with what you've gotten already, or you want to go for maybe a higher, um, you want to learn more, or you want to go higher. So we have a um, job as a code reviewer for every um, certified USTACI graduate. So of course, you are going to undergo some orientation too on how to be a proper code reviewer. So that way, even while you say maybe you want to continue to hone your skills or you want to actually apply for a job, you can actually get a job at Ustaki as a code reviewer where you get paid per code that you review. And also there are other job opportunities um, through the Ustaki program because we actually have um, some partnership. For example, we have the partnership with um, Innovation Hub. So wherein some of our graduates can be, uh, you know, we can actually advise if there is an opportunity to be given out to uh, people. So we have partnership with Innovation Hub. It's something we can just say, oh, we have students that have graduated. So once you have any opportunity, whether in terms of uh, being in the startup space, internship or job opportunity, they can easily notify us. And, you know, we can notify graduates from the um, Ustaki platform. Also, which is under works, we have the jobs portal, where it's going to be easy for you as a graduate of Ustaki to list, you know, your your skills, what you've learned on Ustaki, your courses, what you know, and easily recruiters can just go there to the platform and actually give you the job when you've applied for it, of course, and, you know, get solid talent, qualified talent from the um, Ustaki platform. Now, some of the micro degrees that we have, so they are based on different paths. So we have the introduction path. So this introduction path is for people that have maybe zero to no knowledge at all of the of, um, of programming generally of programming generally. so it is important that um people that have no idea of what programming is that you um you know you can try this um introduction to programming micro degree so basically what this does is it teaches you the programming basics what you need to check out for what you need to know you're also introduced to html and also you are introduced to Python. So of course, Python being um, the choice here because it is also a versatile programming language. You are going into software development or you want to go into data science or whatever field you want to go into. So Python is a very, very good um, language for that. So which is why you are going to be learning that. And the project you are going to be building is a web scraping application that gets information from an e-commerce um, website. So one beautiful thing is that when we do our project, we usually have two kinds of projects. We have the instructor-led project, which is a project that the instructor would actually take you through on how to do. And then we have the capstone project, which is a project you will do yourself. So we can just take a moment to watch maybe a few minutes or maybe seconds from this. This is the web scraping capstone project overview that you'll be going through on uh, Here is the capstone project for the introduction to programming micro degree. It's a web application with which data is scraped from an e-commerce website. So this is the landing page. And then the functional part of this page is this form. Within this form, we can get to select the category of items that we want to get data from. Likewise, we can set the range for the price, minimum price and then maximum price so that it's within this range that we're going to be getting products whose data we're going to be scraping. So if I get to select phones here, the application is going to go to this page beneath the hood to grab data from each of these product items that we'll have on this page within the smartphones section. 
and then it's going to grab the name of the product the price and link to the dedicated page for each of those products similarly if it's not the phones but the electronics category the web application is going to come here and then each of those elements that we have in the electronics category for this page data is going to be gotten from each of them the name the price and the link to dedicated page and then of course values for minimum price maximum price are set and then it's just the products whose price fall in between this range that are selected for scraping so since we have values for each of these input boxes if i click on submit the data is fetched and then it is displayed in a very readable format here in a table so we have name we have the price and then we have links to each of the products so if i click on this it redirects to the dedicated page for the product so that's basically how this application works so it is created using python's flask framework and then the scraping is done using the beautiful soup web scraping library so there we can see um we can see one of the use tacky here is the capstone project for the introduction to programming micro degree so there we can actually see the capstone project for the introduction to programming so that's a pretty interesting uh project so the here next is the capstone project so the next we have on that here is, is um, the actually front end development path. So the micro degree we have under that is the front end developer micro degree. And here you are going to be taught from the core fundamentals of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So you are going to be taught from the core fundamentals. And it might come up as a question that okay, why are you not using Frameworks, you know, you're not using React, you're not using Vue. So um, we have actually, we, in fact, we made a video on that where we actually explain to people why it is very, very important that you start your programming from the fundamentals, the core principles. You see, and you might be surprised that oh, come on, I already know front end now. Why would I go and take a micro degree on front end developer again? That will just teach me HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But the thing is that there are a lot of things we don't actually know when it comes to the core fundamentals and these usually come up to actually haunt a lot of us when maybe we were seeking for a job in a technical interview you are told to do just something that seems simple but because you don't have that core fundamental you have a problem solving it also it is a very very big reason why people have imposter syndrome where they feel you are not good enough because they've been missing on the core principles and the fundamentals of the programming language or the web technology that is supposed to be used for that particular program so when you take this micro degree from you starting, you have about five minutes more okay when you take this um this particular program from you stacky you are going to be getting um a very very nice um combination of html and javascript and also you'll be building an interesting project which is an e-commerce website so we could just play maybe a few moments of that for you to see This is the e-commerce website you'll be building where users can purchase tech products. So it has three sections, the intro section, the about section, and then the shop section where the products are listed. And when you over on any of the products, you can actually see the price. So the user has to be able to see the price when he or she overs on any of the sections. Sorry. The total amount to be paid. Then before the shop link takes you to the shop, section also the shop now button takes you to the shop section as you can see and then we have the cart so this is our cart system so it has no item added to the cart so it's not showing any of the item it will have the serial so number the item long video, the so price I think and I then the quantity some of and then we also so we have a section here we have a fully functional cart system where you can actually add um, but you can click on continue you can add products shift I to from bring your website in a row with this for the responsiveness so let's go to the cut and then we have so a quantity you can see we have them come let's so add this add, and yeah, let's add see. this so you can add products so from we now have two items added to the from your shop click on that you see you can see we have them the coming up and the beautiful thing about this is it's not just um 
it's not just something that's not functional. It is fully functional. Can in that you also integrate so it's with it your name. pay stack. So you integrate the okay. pay stack to payment uh, platform. Add. So which is this? Let's so see let's that here. Phone the pay stack. And there you have it. So when you click so on the checkout. So you can click on the checkout. So you close that particular cart. Then the pay stack model so pops see. up. So you can and actually you can pay add the, add um, with pay stack of we don't want to so pay it's fully functional e-commerce so website. Success. And you'll be building all this with just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So by taking that uh content developer micro degree. And the next one, also the part that we have we have for the backend development part. Here we have two micro degrees focusing on this. We have the PHP backend developer micro degree, where you'll be using PHP and um, SQL to actually build the back end of a of a website you actually also be taught html too and we also have the python back end developer micro degree here you'll be taught how to become a back end developer using python sql and flask which is a python framework because this makes it easier for you to use python on the on the back end and the project you'll be doing here is a student's portal so you'll be building a here student's is portal. the application that would serve as the capstone project for the course so basically like the school, of the course one should be off his details system that you have here these details uh, and these are some of the things the that you have where they are there your cv or resume is database. very very good there are some and other sections of the application give you a lot of, where details um, of all chance when on get this comes, get started here we are internship. in the student so portal very, very form page so here is the interface where the user enters all of the user can enter the information open then so the, user the other the select room, box doesn't have any option. The submit button. So and on clicking on this button, all of these details are sent to the server side, from where they are then inserted into the. But so you can see after that clicking on we'll the have submit, here just a few of the details. If you want so after clicking on the submit, you can actually see. So you have um, the students being listed here, and you can actually view. The students so like there's a front end to that and there's a back end. so you'll be building you'll be building the back end of this particular um application which is a student portal um application then after that we have the full stack the full stack development path the full stack development path has also php full stack developer where you'll be going through html css javascript php and sql while the Python full stack developer micro degree has HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Python, SQL, and Flask. However, you must know that all these micro degrees also come, like I said, with the career series course. So you will always have the career series course in all these micro degree to actually help you in you know writing your resume and all. So here, for this micro degree, you would actually be doing a combination of your front end projects and the back end projects. So what do I mean is that you'll be building the e-commerce web application and you'd also be building the student's portal but this time around you don't just be building the back end of the student portal application you'll be building both the front end and the back end because you are a full stack developer so those are the interesting micro degrees that we have currently on ustacky and of course we hope to um, give you more of that um with in coming in coming days so how are we actually um, the best team actually do this or what makes us you know to be qualified enough to actually be the ones to do this so it is that the team at USAC is actually made up of senior software developers data scientists ui ux designers with over 20 years of you know experience in teaching it skills to students both offline and offline in fact our founders have actually created courses on other platforms you know with over several students before actually seeing that you know what this problem needs to be solved straight and headlong. You know, it needs to be targeted. And that was why Ustaki was actually um, created. So we're actually a team of IT professionals that know where it is actually paining the developer, especially an African developer or someone that wants to be a developer that is an African. We know where the problem is and we are attacking it um, directly. So that is that on my presentation. So, we are inviting you to join us at Ustaki so that you can actually move from zero to world class. Thank you very much. And that is my presentation.
So that um, is the end of my presentation. And also that means we'll be coming to the end of the program soon. However, before um, we go, I would like to give us, because it's one of those things that we actually promised, for every attendee of this particular program, you are going to be getting a coupon code. That means that you can actually get any of our micro degree. You can actually get them at 50% discount of their normal price. So this is actually one of the ways, aside the fact that our micro degrees are very, very affordable. They are really, really affordable. They are not costly. And with all the things we have actually packed to into those micro degrees for that price, they are very, very cheap and um, affordable. However, we still go ahead, you know, to give you discount when you maybe you can't afford um, that particular price. That is because we actually care enough about um, Africans, Nigerians. We know how the situation is. So even when you cannot pay enough, you know, we, we talk to you uh, to get to know, okay, we can give you certain discounts. So for everyone that is attending this program, you can get 50% discount with the coupon code that is going to be given uh, to you. So I would actually, let me just um, type that right here for everyone to see. Let me just type that right there for everyone to see. So it is zero to world class O one. So the coupon code zero to world class O one. That is the coupon code to get fifty percent discount on all micro degrees from Ustaki. And the way as um buying a course or a micro degree rather on Ustaki, the way it works is there are two options for you. You can pay once and get access, like a lifetime access. That is pay once and get lifetime access to the micro degree, or you can pay monthly. So it means that when you use this coupon code for the lifetime access, you get a 50% discount on the lifetime access for that particular micro degree. And if you use it on the monthly also, that means you get 50% discount on the monthly payment um, you want to make. So we invite you to join us at Ustaki today to move from zero to world class. Thank you very much and thank you for attending uh, this program. So if we have any question or you want to know more, about um you stacky okay i can also see that we have some questions that need to be answered so let me just put this on the screen the zero to world class 01 so that is the coupon code you can use so someone's asking if they can get if they can actually do more than one micro degree simultaneously yes you can yes you can you can take more than one you stacky micro degree simultaneously and also we have data science micro degree yes so someone is asking for that. We have a data science micro degree to solve, um, the, you know, any problem we are facing in terms of data science. So in it, um, we okay, we have a data science uh, micro degree. So the data science micro degree, I think I skipped that when I was doing my presentation. I'm very sorry. So in the data science micro degree, we actually have, you are going to be taught SQL. You are going to be taught Python. Remember that Mr. Wasius Anusi mentioned that you should know programming as a data scientist, not just, you know, doing Excel and all. So you should know programming. That is why the Ustaki data science micro degree has in it Python. So you understand the fundamentals of Python. You also are going to be taught SQL and also Pandas. Pandas is going to be taught to you there and how you can use SQL and Pandas. And when you are done with that particular micro degree, your capstone project is actually going to be Giving analysis, you are going to be doing two projects. One is instructor guided, which is actually um, giving information. You'll be doing data analysis on an e-commerce store, an e-commerce company actually that has a chain of um rather a supermarket have a chain of um a company has a chain of supermarket rather across Nigeria. And for your capstone project, which is the one you'll be doing and submitting to your code reviewer, that is actually analyzing the COVID-19 data. In Nigeria, so you can see that our projects are not just, um, they are not projects that are just cooked up, rather, they are projects that are real life. That people that are employed into those positions and companies, what they are actually working on is what we give you to do as a um, as project. So, yes, we have a micro degree for you on data on data science. So, I think that answers uh, the question. And to join the Ustaki um, platform. 
you can simply go to www.ustaki.com so and to see our micro degrees you can go to ustaki.com forward slash micro degree so i'll just leave that here so ustaki.com forward slash micro degrees to see all of our micro degrees that we are offering at uh, ustaki and also another thing that you need to know is that our programs are self-paced meaning that you don't need to be available at one time and don't you shouldn't be available no it is not that it is self-paced so all the videos that you need to go through are online already so all you just you just you can watch it at your leisure whenever you are free whenever you want to take it whether it's in the night whether it's in the morning you can take it whenever you want to you want to take it so there is no end to um the ustaki micro degree and of course once you finish you get your certificate um as a graduate of um, ustaki for that particular program so you can go to ustaki.com to learn more or go to ustaki.com slash micro degrees to see our micro degrees thank you very much for your attendance and i think that brings us to the end of the program thank you very much and your coupon code can be used yes more than once you can use that coupon code on any micro degree whether two three micro degrees you can use it on as much micro degree as you want to use it on thank you very much yeah so i mentioned you can take more than one micro degree at a time you can take more than one micro degree at a time so you can whether for example you are taking a um, front end and you are taking back end developer micro degree. you can take the two you can take the two at the same um, at the same time on you starkey platform so it's left to you in trying to focus to make sure that you achieve your 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 aim so you can actually take as much as um you want at the same time they do not affect each other and also the coupon code works for all the micro you can use for more than one micro degree it's your choice so thank you for attending and if you have any further information that you need from us or you have any further question you can just simply send it to support at ustaki.com you can send it to support at ustaki.com and also for those that are asking for the recording of this particular session so you will get it you get the recording of this session is also going to be on youtube where you can actually come back to watch it so you go to support as you if you have any further question for you stacky we'll also make sure we leave that in the description of this video you can come back to watch this video after the event has ended thank you very much for attending and i think that is the end of um, the program so thank you everyone and thank you to our speakers you are really really appreciated we thank you for your time and really appreciate so we hope we can do this more often for the community so we can all grow together. Thank you very much.